Welcome to Washington Square News. This is Op-Ed Live. I'm joined today by Laura Atkins from Torch Pack, a bipartisan organization aimed at strengthening U.S.-Israel relations, and Kumar Salehi from Students for Justice in Palestine, a coalition of activists bringing attention to the plight of Palestinians. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. So, obviously we'll be talking about the ongoing crisis between Israel and Palestine. So, Laura, if you would, would you kind of explain what's been going on in the past few weeks? I mean, the tensions are back up. Right. So, to condense everything, basically in negotiations between the Palestinian Authority and Israel, there are a set of preconditions that both sides have agreed to. In the past two weeks, both sides have violated things they've agreed to. On the side of Israel, Israel has refused to give up a fourth round of political prisoners that they have agreed to. On the Palestinian Authority side, they have taken additional actions outside of the negotiating table and acted unilaterally to gain recognition in different international circles. Okay. So if I could actually just add on to that. So Israel has committed a further infraction of the terms of negotiation, and that is that um, once again, additional settlement blocks. Oh, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll get were, to that. We'll get to okay. the infractions. But why does this issue matter to on college campuses? Why should so we I be think, talking about it at NYU? I think students see that the ongoing peace process is failing to um, produce anything like uh, freedom for Palestinians, uh, or or even a solution. Maybe they just want to see it over with. Uh, I think that people especially students, see that uh, our government is the biggest supporter um, in terms of diplomacy, in terms of uh, finances of the state of Israel. Um, and I think that they see, or they're starting to see, thanks to work of groups like ours, that their universities, in fact, are heavily invested in um, the occupation and in Israeli human rights abuses. Laura? I think it's important for us as members of the Global Network University to really be able to think critically about these global issues and examine things from both sides of the media and be able to tell fact from emotional fiction. And I think that's really important for students to be able to do. Okay, so let's analyze the fact. I mean, why don't you think that there's been progress on this issue? I mean, we've been in an endless stalemate. Arguably for 3,000 years. <laughs> so yeah. two basic things have to happen for the process to move forward. First of all, both sides have to be able to admit that both sides have a legitimate claim to this area in one way or another. Secondly, we believe that the Palestinian Authority needs to end their campaign of anti-Israel propaganda. The state-sponsored media time and time again says that victory is when we see you suffer. They say that Israelis are Zionist pigs. They do things that are very counteractive in this process. Also, we need to see the bombings from the Palestinian Authority stop. Kamers, what do you think? So I actually think that the peace process is itself set up in a way that allows Israel to continue to build settlements in the West Bank, uh, in the Golan Heights, and ultimately uh, Palestinian negotiators uh, protest or calling off this or that round of negotiations to protest let's say, Israel's refusal to release prisoners or additional settlements, they um, will ultimately allow Israel to continue to build more settlements by prolonging the negotiations. At the end, uh, there will be a reversion to uh, what are called the pre-1967 borders, or the borders agreed to by the UN in 1949, um, with land swaps, which means that large populations of Israelis who live in settlements would be um, a part of the Israeli state and large populations of Palestinians in Israel could be transferred to the Palestinian state. This lets Israel keep a democratic majority within uh, Israel and continue to um, give preferential rights to Jews while uh, shunting off an unwanted Palestinian population onto a state that wouldn't actually have the arable land economic infrastructure that it would need to be viable and independent of Israel. So it's, it's interesting that you brought up the West Bank, because what we've seen historically is that every time we get close to an agreement, the last time, for example, it's say 2000, Israel agreed to give up 95% of the West Bank. They agreed to give up parts of East Jerusalem. They agreed to give up all these things that you brought up, but at the end of the day, the Palestinian Authority 
walked away from the table and engaged in the second Intifada, which was a series of bombings that killed thousands of Israeli citizens. So the Palestinians, they may say that these are the preconditions, but even when Israel agrees to give them these things, they walk away from the table. Do you think U.S. involvement is helping negotiations? I wouldn't say that necessarily it makes a huge difference. I think that the biggest issues, even John Kerry himself says, at the end of the day, the two parties have to come to an agreement between themselves. I think the biggest issues are the ones that I mentioned. So, Humorous? Do you I, think he was involved in it? I think thing? that, personally, John Kerry seems to be genuinely interested in a solution. I don't know if he really understands what the peace process means to Israel, because the peace process itself, direct negotiations, are a subversion of international law, international law that would hold Israel accountable for war crimes. The PA isn't the only entity that has committed war crimes against civilians on a systematic basis. In fact, I would argue Israel does so much more. Um, but, but these are all uh, issues that if Palestine were a member state, for example, in uh, the UN, or part of the International Criminal Court could actually prosecute Israel, hold it accountable. In this way, uh, the United States actually shields Israel from accountability by saying, look, uh, we can't force Israel to change its policies, to stop discriminating against Palestinians, to stop killing them and demolishing their homes. What we can do is just sit them down in front of each other and let's see if Israel um, negotiates away its uh, special privileges for Jews so, it's not going to happen. Okay, so let's turn the tables a bit. What do you think Palestine could and should do differently? I think that the Palestinian Authority should abandon the current framework of negotiations because, as I said, it actually uh, plays into Israel's hands. What the Palestinian Authority and anyone who claims to pal represent uh, Palestinians should do is uh, demand um, Equal rights for Palestinians within Israel should demand uh, an end to the occupation of uh, the West Bank, uh, annexed East Jerusalem, and uh, the end to the siege of Gaza, and also the right of Palestinian refugees to return. Seven million of them driven out by Zionist militias and Israeli settlement policies. They have a right to return to their homelands. Laura, what do you think Israel could and should do differently? I think Israel should stop allowing the double standard in the media to take place. They are seen as the aggressors when the Palestinian Authority has been bombing them constantly, when they have been the ones coming to the table with these tangible deals that give the Palestinians everything that they've asked for. So I think that Israel needs to be a lot more aggressive in laying down terms and framework and working towards a deal that will be sustainable. It's interesting that you're both calling for more aggression on both sides. Thank you for joining me.